Welcome back to today's video. Today's video is one that's special to me. It's arguably one of my favorite movies ever, uh, Glory Road. And we're going to be going over the top 10 players in the movie and where their careers like, actually ended up after the movie. The movie is about um, Texas Western, who, which is now known as UTEP. Um, they ended up playing Kentucky Wildcats in the finals in the 1966 NCAA championship. And the significance of it was that Coach Don Haskins actually only played African-American kids that day. He didn't end up playing any of the white kids that were on the team. Um, this moment was a major step forward, and it paved the way for many other African-Americans to get into basketball and other teams to try this on their teams as well. In terms of what happened at the end of the game, I would recommend just watching the movie. It's really, really worth your time. But we're going to go over the top 10 players and how their careers panned out after the movie and the game, I guess, 1966. So let's get into it. Cue the intro. Start things off at number 10, we have Jerry Armstrong. Jerry Armstrong was someone who started a lot of games for Don Haskins in the minors in 1966. He was one of the white players that actually didn't get to end up playing against the Kentucky Wildcats in the finals due to the circumstances that Don Haskins wanted it to be. Um, he ended up saying that that was probably the best experience that could have happened because if it wasn't for that, then the Glory Road mo the movie probably would have never been made and they probably wouldn't have got the coverage that they got. But to say some of his accolades, he is currently in the Missouri Hall of Fame um, for his coaching career that he did. He coached high school basketball for 30 years, and he has a record of 329 wins and 195 losses. Um, so that's Jerry Armstrong. Not much of a basketball career after that, but a prolific coaching career. Coming in at number nine, we have Willie Cager. He was actually a really good player in the movie. Um, he was the one that ended up having heart problems and had to stop playing for a while, but made it back into the finals. Um, he ended up being drafted by the Bullets in the 12th round, um, but due to the heart complications that he showed in the movie, he wasn't able to ever play basketball. But just to be drafted in the NBA um, is a perfect feat of its own um, and shows that he was a tremendous basketball player. Coming in at number eight, we have Neville Shedd. Neville Shedd was known in the movie for being the one that was soft and Coach Don Haskins almost sent him home. But he actually has had a really good basketball career after the movie. Um, he was drafted by the Boston Celtics in the fourth round, um, but again, just like Willie Cager, he was never able to play because he tore up his leg in training camp. Um, so he was never able to even get in, get in a game. Um, but after that, he also became um, the director of a Spurs basketball camp. So he teaches kids um, the right way to play basketball and um, helps um, the people around the local community in San Antonio learn the game of basketball, um, which is very great. So unfortunately, he couldn't make it into a game for the Celtics. I'm very curious what would have happened if he did. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to. So this is Neville Shedd, and him being drafted by the Celtics um, is why he is at number eight. Coming in at number seven, we have Willie Worsley. This is finally someone who actually got to get in some games in the ABA. Although it's not the NBA, it was before the NBA and ABA mergers, so the ABA is still a very respectable league. Um, Willie Worsley, he played for the New York Nets, and he played 24 games for them. And he was a kind of a legend in New York City. He won the New York City Championship when he played for Dewitt Clinton High School in 1963. Um, so he was a, a very strong player, and he was able to do a lot um, in the ABA and in the basketball community. Interesting enough, he was 5'9", and so it's really amazing that he was able to do what he did um, at, his, um, at his height. Unfortunately, he was only able to be in the league for one year, so that's why he's stuck at number seven. Coming in at number six, we have Tommy Cron. Tommy Cron is someone who played for the Hawks as a rookie. He was a third round pick um, his rookie year. And then his second year, he actually moved to Seattle and he played for them for two seasons from in the 1967-1968 season and the 1968-1969 season. Um, he came off the bench and he scored 9.7 points um, his first season and 5.1 points his second season. He um, is someone who actually played for the Kentucky team. He played against the Texas Miners in the championship game, but very strong player and was able to do a lot for the 
Kentucky Wildcats. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything of Tommy Cron, so that's why I just had to put some footage footage up, but he was a great basketball player and why he is number six. Coming in at number five, we have Bobby Joe Hill. He's the one that Don Haskins really um, sought after. He was the one that was heavily recruited by Don Haskins and was going to be the focal point of the team. Um, he's at number five be because he did never play in the NBA. I think if he would have been able to get into the NBA, he would have had a, been higher on the list because he, he showed that he could be better than a lot of these people that were above him. But he decided not to play in the NBA. But overall, he's still an NCAA championship. And because of the potential that he would have had if he would have been in the NBA, I have him at number five. Next, coming at number four, we have David Latin, Big Daddy D. He was he was a really, really strong player in college. Um, he was an All-American during the 1966 and 1967 season. He, after his college and his time at, as a minor, he was drafted by San Francisco Warriors and the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, so, you know, basketball and football. Um, for Kansas City Chiefs, he was going to be a wide receiver. During his time in the NBA, he's able to play for teams like the Phoenix Suns, the Pittsburgh Condors, Memphis Tams, and he would actually finish his career as a Harlem Globetrotter for three years. He also has a grandson who plays for the Oklahoma City Sooners, so he has strong basketball ties in his family. So with David Latin being an All-American for the years he was and being in the NBA for as many years as he was, it's no question why he's number four on the list. Coming in at number three, we have a man that almost all of you should have heard if you're an NBA fan. His name is Pat Riley. He actually played for the Kentucky Wildcats against the Miners in the finals and is currently the president of the Miami Heat and has put together a pretty good squad. You know, we saw them in the finals this year and they performed very well. But some of his accolades are he's one of the greatest NBA coaches of all time. He has five NBA championships as a coach, four with the Showtime Lakers and uh, one with the Heat in 2006. Um, he's been NBA coach of the year three times, 88-90 um, season, 92-93 season, and 96-97 season, coaching with the Lakers, New York Knicks, and Heat respectively. And he also has world championship with the Lakers as a player in 1972. But um, this is a, not about accolades as in the NBA, but it's about accolades as a player. Um, if, you were, if these were about accolades, um, he would be number one for sure. But as a player, he was only able to get one championship and he even came off the bench for a lot of his career. Due to all these things, this is why Pat Riley is number three on the list. But I still love him and he still has a great career as a basketball coach and player. Right at number two, we have a sharpshooter out of Kentucky. Um, and he was drafted in 1967 by the NBA and the ABA. But he decided to go with ABA due to the fact that they had a three-point line. Um, the NBA ad didn't adopt the three-point line until the 1979-1980 season, while the ABA adopted in 1967-1968. With him being drafted in 1967, his rookie year, the three-point line would have been introduced, and he was a three-point line specialist. Over the first three years in the ABA, he made 500 threes, and in the 1968-1969, he ended up making 199 threes that season. This still ranks him 96 all-time for one season. Um, to put this in perspective, if you look at J.J. Redick and how the most he's ever made in a season, he's the most he's ever made is 200, which is only one more than him, and he ranks 92. So considering how new the three-point line was in 1967 when he got drafted, we can only wonder how many three-pointers he would have made in this era with, when everyone's shooting threes and dropping bombs from deep. Maybe he would have been like a Steph Curry. We have, we have no clue what he could have been. All we can do is speculate. Louis Dampier was also inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2015. So with him being a three-point specialist, and everything he did to move the three-point line forward for everyone else to keep shooting those shots puts him at number two on the list. Coming in at number one, we have actually a guy that isn't even on the Texas Miners or the Kentucky Wildcats. He ended up playing for the Kansas Jayhawks. He goes by the nickname of JoJo White, but his, his full name is Joseph Henry White. He, was, he ended up being the ninth overall pick by the Boston Celtics in the 1969 draft. Interesting enough, just like David Latin, he also was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys to play football, but he ended up deciding to play basketball, and I think it was a good decision for him. His first season, he was named to the NBA All-Rookie Team. He was an All-Star for seven seasons from 1971 to 1977. He won a championship in 1974 and in 1976, and he was named Finals MVP in 1976. Um, when, he, when he retired, he was in the top 100 in field goals made, attempted, assists, free throw percentage, minutes per game, and defensive rating. And he's also a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame. If we remember against the Texas Miners, 
in the semifinals. He was cooking their whole team. If it wasn't for him stepping on the line, the Texas Miners wouldn't have ever made it to the championship game. So um, these are the reasons why JoJo White is number one on the list. I mean, he's a finals MVP. He's won two championships, been an all-star for seven seasons. Um, he had a great career in the NBA. For all these reasons is why JoJo White is number one on the list and the best player in the movie Glory Road. Um, it's a great title to have, um, but yeah, he's number one on the list by far. But thank you for watching the video. It was really fun making. I really enjoyed going over and looking at what the players did. Um, if you if you like this content and like, want to see more videos like this, comment down below some other basketball movies I can rank the players in. And remember to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out a lot, and I really would appreciate it. And remember, as always, this is just my opinion, and I'm Hoop Rat.